Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, How Advanced Therapies Are Changing the Landscape of Rare Disease. My name is Tegan Versalotto, and I'll be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, with time for a question and answer session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I'd like to thank MedPace, who helped develop the content for this presentation. MedPace is a scientifically driven, global, full-service clinical con contract research organization providing phase one through four clinical development services to the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device industries. MedPace's mission is to accelerate the global development of safe and effective medical therapeutics through its high science and disciplined operating approach that leverages local regulatory and deep therapeutic expertise across all major areas. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's event. Dr. Marco, T Marco Tangelder is a senior medical director for MedPace. Dr. Tangelder is a clinical ep epidemiologist with over 25 years of academic, pharmaceutical, and biotech industry experience with a strong background in thrombosis and hemostatus research development of antithrombotic therapies for a broad range of indications and development of gene therapy for hemophilia and ophthalmology. Dr. Tangelder received both his medical degree and PhD at the University of Jurtek in the Netherlands and received his master's in pharmaceutical medicine at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Our next speaker is Dr. Todd Banks, Director of Regulatory Affairs and Regulatory Intelligence for MedPace. Dr. Banks is a clinical pharmacist with over 34 years of pharmaceutical industry experience with a strong background and knowledge in pharma pharmacotherapeutics, drug development, and FDA regulatory sciences. His healthcare experience is comprehensive, encompassing the complete product life cycle from product development to medical affairs and human safety, pharmacovigilance, and regulatory affairs. He's a registered pharmacist, holds a doctorate degree in clinical pharmacy with undergraduate degrees in instrumental chemistry, organic chemistry, natural science, and pharmacy, all from the University of Cincinnati. Our next speaker is Dr. Madhi Maladi, clinical trial manager for MedPace. Dr. Maladi has six over six years of clinical research experience, which includes working on trials involving advanced therapies for rare disease indications. Prior to joining MedPace, she was an assistant research director at New York Presbyterian slash Queens. She has a PhD in cell and molecular biology from the University of Texas at Austin and completed her postdoctoral fellowship in cancer genetics at Columbia University. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic and the presentation over to Todd Banks. Todd, you can go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Great, thanks, Tegan. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2019 Rare Disease X Talk entitled, How Advanced Therapies Are Changing the Landscape of Rare Disease. Thank you for your participation today and for making this webinar a priority in your busy schedules. In the next 60 minutes, we would like to share with you our perspectives from regulatory insights into the scientific advancements of gene therapy and considerations associated with clinical trial management of rare disease research. And although we will discuss challenges and complexities associated with rare disease research, I encourage everyone to leverage these insights to enable you to make a true difference in the lives of those who suffer from rare diseases. Let's start today's discussion by reviewing the following. We'd like to go a little bit over definitions, talk a little bit about rare disease metrics, some global criteria shared across the authorities, uh, I'll introduce some challenges associated with rare disease research, which will be further expanded upon by other speakers, talk just uh, briefly about real-world evidence and natural history, and then conclude with some resources um, to help um, elucidate further on, on this topic. So if we move to definitions, 
Orphan disease and rare disease are synonymous, and they're often used interchangeably and describe rare, serious conditions representing unmet medical needs. It is true that orphan drugs are used to treat rare diseases. And I think another part that uh, sometimes is confusing is that in the U.S., the term orphan drug applies to a much broader subset than drugs alone, because it also encompasses biologicals, medical devices, and dietary products. It's important to recognize that there's no harmonized global definition for rare disease, and therefore qualifying criteria differ by geography and could result in a rare disease in one geography not being recognized by another. You know, I, I've got the uh, quote here from Orphanet, which I, I think is, is important. You know, rare diseases are in fact rare, but rare diseases are numerous, and we should keep that in mind as we move through this presentation. In general, rarity is defined in terms of prevalence, which is existing cases uh, in the numerator and the population at risk in the denominator. And as a general statement across the globe, it is usually the occurrence is less than four to six uh, sufferers per 10,000 population. So let's review some rare disease metrics and characterize the scale and impact of those affected by rare disease. There's approximately 7,000 known rare diseases worldwide. Approximately 85% of these rare diseases are associated with genetic abnormalities. And there are some authorities that practice mutual recognition of rare disease. For example, about 62% of orphan drug applications are submitted in parallel between the US and the EU. 50% of those 7,000 rare diseases affect primarily children. And 35% of all cause mortality by age one is associated with a rare disease. And I think remarkably, 30% of children suffering from a rare disease will die before the age of five. So six to 8% of the world's population is in fact affected by a rare disease. So again, Again, uh, punctuating that, um, that patients are, are quite numerous. Only about 5% of rare diseases have an FDA-approved therapy, and I mention that only because FDA initiated formalized legislation back in 1983 and has been involved in this pursuit the longest, but yet um, we can only talk about 5% achievement against this cause. Most rare diseases are inherited and caused by gene defects. And unfortunately, the time to an accurate rare disease diagnosis has been reported to be between five and seven years after symptomatic onset. So I mentioned uh, the legislative actions in orphan drug. This has really been a formalized process for the last 36 years, originating in the US. I've listed here on the slide other countries as they adopted legislation. And this list continues to grow as others adopt and recognize this effort. So when we talk to the global criteria, again, important to emphasize there is no global or universally accepted definition of a rare disease. I've illustrated in the table here three of uh, the countries that have the most developed and comprehensive uh, rare disease legislation. And as you can see, when we look at the definition of a rare disease, again, it's all bracketed between that less than four to six sufferers per 10,000 people. The benefits of pursuing rare disease development does earn the successful sponsor exclusivity, and exclusivity also varies by geography. And coupled with the pursuit of rare disease research, or other incentives such as expedited regulatory pathways that then can be added onto or done in addition to orphan considerations and privileges. I did want to note that unlike the EU, which reviews their orphan designees uh, after five years of in-market life to assess uh, whether the product is being made available and, and available to users, 
and then to a much limited extent, um, whether or not the product uh, profitability has been impacted. Um, that really represents a very minor component, but it is a consideration that the EU authorities reassess whether or not the approved rare disease drugs are meeting their objective goal. That is in contrast to the US once a decision is made, the FDA does not go back to reassess um, whether or not to continue that exclusivity. Although an application for an orphan drug designation can be applied for at any stage in the investigational development, prior to submitting the market authorization request, there are some strategic considerations to be aware of. For example, designations are often announced publicly, which alerts competition, and that has to be weighed in contrast to the benefit of earlier engagement with the authorities. So th that is probably a lecture series in itself in terms of strategic considerations, but I just wanted to point out that the application for consideration of an orphan designation is typically held confidential, but an affirmed decision is made public. So let's review some of these incentives that, offer, that are offered to encourage research to develop treatments for rare disease. Each country with an established orphan medicinal product legislation offers these incentives to a different degree and different amount. And, and I'll show later a summary slide uh, that illustrates which are afforded by which geography. But most universally will reduce or eliminate associated application fees. And to put that into perspective, in 2019, to file a new drug application with the FDA, uh, the fee is approximately $2.6 million. So an orphan drug would be exempt from that, that fee. There's also privileges in terms of pre-licensing uh, access. So for those countries that do not have available therapy, there are provisions that if that therapy is approved in another geography, they may be afforded the privilege to import someone else's product and use it while the local authority is investigating its status. There are many procedures for accelerated review and procedures, and those also come with additional privileges. There's early and frequent scientific advice and protocol assistance as you're maturing your development program. There are research grants, and oftentimes, because of the nature of this type of research, uh, trial sizes are somewhat smaller. And if a rare disease therapy is approved, other incentives such as market exclusivity, pediatric vouchers, tax exemption and credits uh, will come into scope for consideration. There is a standardized process for requesting preliminary assessments of qualification, which really comprise of you make a request for the authorities to assess whether your proposition qualifies for consideration. And if it so does qualify, can be designated, that is the public part. And then once designated, the sponsor has to earn uh, successful approval for market authorization, and it's upon market authorization that many of these benefits uh, come to fruition. So if we look to rare disease metrics, I want to just use some statistics from the U.S. to illustrate how many uh, orphan drug designation requests are received. And I think what's more important than even looking at the numbers that are portrayed in the chart here is looking at the growing trend. So as science advances, as technology advances, as these incentives are better understood, as the rules of engagement of successfully developing rare disease therapies, there is a growing trend in terms of those involved, which is uh, great news for science uh, and for sufferers of rare disease. So allow me to illustrate the application process by sharing or these orphan drug metrics. You can see the obvious escalation trend in the number of requests seeking qualification as a treatment for rare disease. And in 2019 specifically, there were 526 orphan drug requests submitted to FDA. If we move to the next slide, you can see based on those that were submitted, of the 526, 
476 of them actually received the orphan drug designation, again, in reference to 2017. This represents about a 90% success rate for applications to receive a designation status. Once a designation status is awarded, that decision is published in the Federal Register by the FDA, hence the public notification. And since 1983, more than 5,000 orphan designations have been granted by the FDA. But it really comes down to where's the success? And the success is who has received commercial approval and hence the approved benefits of the orphan uh, designation. So again, if we go back, 526 applications submitted to FDA for initial consideration, of which 476 received the designation. But then we have about 77 therapies that were successfully approved. And that really translates to approximately a 16% success rate between designated applications and successful commercial opportunities. So I mentioned that uh, a slide to give just simply a snapshot to illustrate how different geographies offer different incentives and benefits. And I've tried to capture that as succinctly as possible in this one chart. So if you look to simply the green check marks to represent that these considerations are offered, uh, whereas the red X marks, those considerations are not part of the legislative process for the countries uh, listed. This next slide I realize is very much an eye chart. This is not really something I wanted to discuss in detail. It's, it really serves as a snapshot summary uh, for future reference, and it captures most of the information already discussed in the other slides today. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges associated with rare disease research. And many of these challenges will be discussed in context by the other speakers during today's presentation and are listed here to illustrate some of the common challenges encountered when conducting rare disease research. And while there are common pathologies interlaced among the thousands of rare diseases, there are also common challenges in conducting investigational research. I just wanted to kind of set the tone for the subsequent speakers by uh, listing um, these considerations. There's oftentimes limited knowledge of the disease etiology and the pathophysiology associated with the rare diseases. Oftentimes, no or limited preclinical models, limited or unknown natural history or real world evidence to help support clinical decisions. The standard of care may not be established. Surrogate indicators such as biomarkers may not exist. And what we are seeing is a growing trend amongst the uh, authorities where they're much more receptive to bring in the science behind understanding disease uh, to help support these early studies. Clinical endpoints may in fact be ill-defined or lack clinician consensus. We have a lot of uh, geographical dispersion amongst the patients that qualify for the rare disease of interest. A small proportion of these uh, patients are treatment naive. We had talked about the heterogeneity and the late diagnosis often associated with rare disease patients being about a five to seven year delay from onset of symptoms. So uh, same thing with uh, dose and therapeutic optimization challenges typically are not pursued as in traditional uh, drug research. And traditionally drugs are investigated in adults before children but as we had mentioned earlier, about 50% of rare diseases affect children. So oftentimes we don't have the benefit of doing the traditional approaches uh, before we move into the pediatric population. So I'd mentioned a little bit about real world evidence and natural history. And I just wanted the listeners to be sensitized to the fact that rare disease uh, natural history studies are essential to gain the clinical insight and assist in determining clinical endpoints to help define the disease population, to assist with selecting outcome measures, to identify prudent and appropriate biomarkers. And in some cases, these biomarkers are now being accepted by the authorities as surrogate endpoints. In 2012, FDA, under their Safety Innovation Act, expanded the list of acceptable surrogate endpoints that 
they will accept as support in clinical studies supporting rare diseases. So they now are looking essentially at all credible sources to inform on how to predict the disease, how to diagnose, how to treat, and how to follow up. There are also many approaches to conducting natural history studies, and each of these have their rightful place. And again, this would probably represent its own lecture series in terms of the strategy of how best to approach that, whether to rely on retrospective or prospective studies, cross-sectional or longitudinal studies, all of those have a rightful place. So with that, I wanted to capture a few resources uh, as a follow-up to, to our talk today. So orphan drug uh, regulations can be found in the 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 316 by FDA. And also the Office of Orphan Product Development uh, invites people to send emails or contact them with questions related to the U.S. I've included the email address for that office. The other organizations I'm hoping are familiar to folks, I'll not read through the list, but these are kind of the authoritative resources to begin to investigate how to pursue what's been done, state of the art uh, of the current developments in the rare disease of interest. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, this does conclude my remarks. I would now like to introduce Dr. Marco Tengelder to share his perspective on scientific advancements in gene therapy. Marco, over to you. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, so in this uh, next part of today's webinar, um, I will give you an overview of recent advancements with gene therapy and particularly in the area of hemophilia and ophthalmology, which are my main areas of expertise with gene therapy. But before that, let me start with providing you with some basics about gene therapy, as not all of you may be familiar with this, in my view, exciting technology and clinical applications. So the principle of gene therapy is actually quite simple and elegant. Gene therapy aims to insert a certain gene into the nuclei of patients' target cells. With that, there are several ways to treat diseases. The most common approach is to replace a mutated gene that causes a disease with a healthy, that is a functioning, copy of that gene. Another approach is to introduce a new, new gene into the body to target a causal disease factor. And thirdly, we can inactivate a mutated gene with improper function. Gene therapy has to be delivered in the cell's nuclei via a so-called vector or by gene editing, also known as CRISPR-Cas, in order to achieve these effects. Delivery of a gene can be done via a non-viral vector, such as plasmids, liposomes, or other particles, which is called transfection. This method is currently mainly used in bench research. The other way is via a viral vector. This is called transduction. The most commonly used types are adeno-associated viruses, and this method is mostly applied clinically in patients. This figure shows how transduction with a viral vector works. The viral factor containing the appropriate gene sequence, also known as the gene cassette, infects the target cells where it's packaged in a vesicle and subsequently releases, into the, gene, releases the gene into the cell nucleus. Once delivered there, the gene starts to produce the protein which is needed to treat the specific disease. There is an abundant choice of adeno-associated viruses as vector. It is important to pick the optimal type, and this can be firstly done based on tropism and infection potency for target organs and their cells. Secondly, the prevalence of neutralizing antibodies is of importance, as they may diminish the effect of the gene's trans transduction. And all of us may have been infected in the past by naturally occurring 
adeno-associated viral types. AAV5, for example, is known to have a low prevalence of neutralizing antibodies. And this may possibly be due to being divergent in the AAV phylogenetic tree, as you can see in this picture. In this picture. Well, with understanding of the basics of gene therapy, the next step is to achieve a viable gene therapy product. For this, obviously, efficacy is needed by means of a durable or sustainable and, of course, a clinically meaningful expression of the gene product. Besides efficacy, safety is, of course, of crucial importance. There should be no target organ damage caused by the gene therapy. And also, immunogenicity issues, such as T-cell responses, should be avoided. Particularly in liver-directed gene therapy, uh, this can cause transaminase elevations and need for immune suppressive therapies. I mentioned already the prevalence of antibodies. That should be low of pre-existing antibodies against the AAV serotype. Finally, commercial manufacturing should be possible and here scalability, reproducibility of the product as well as good cost of goods are of importance. But this is beyond today's topic. This pie shows you the various diseases that can be targeted with gene therapy. The number of trials as registered on clinicaltrials.gov back in 2016 are given. The innovation and R&D increase over the last few years is clear when we look, for example, at ocular diseases. The number of trials increased from 33 in 2016 to no less than 104 in 2019. I think that these metrics are also um, reflected previously by, uh, by Todd and demonstrate clearly the growth of innovation in this area. And R&D advancements have led to the first real successes as well. Clibera was the first conditionally approved gene therapy in Europe. However, it has recently been withdrawn due to lack of patients that could be treated with lipoprotein lipase deficiency, the indication of the product, and also because of the high cost of the treatment and maintenance of the product on the market as well. A second major breakthrough was the approval of Luxterna for retinal dystrophy due to an RPE65 mutation by the end of 2017 in the US and a year later in Europe. The RPE65 gene encodes the RPE65 protein. RPE65 is necessary for vitamin A metabolism in photoreceptor cells in the retina. The RPE65 protein is located actually in the, in the pigmental epithelial cells and there it converts retinol during the visual cycle. The visual cycle is a critical in the biologic, biological conversion of light into electrical signals. This leads to retinal degeneration and early vision loss and ultimately blindness. Therefore, Luxterna was developed, particularly as there was no treatment for this severe type of retinal disease. The pivotal phase three trial proved a significant improvement in a mobility test, which is a functional vision assessment in treated patients versus randomized control patients, as you can see, in the panel on the left-hand side. The treat, treated patients are given in green and the control patients in blue. There was also a significant improvement in full field stimulus threshold, which is a diagnostic test to assess visual functioning 
in patients with low vision, as you can see on the right hand side. As I already mentioned, this innovative clinical development program has now led to the first available therapy for patients with this sight threatening type of retinal dystrophy. Now let me move from ophthalmology into hemophilia. This is, in my view, another therapeutic area with a huge clinical advancement that I highlight today. And this counts for hemophilia type A as well as type B. And I will share some data from the letter type. Hemophilia B is caused by a lack of or non-functional clotting factor 9 with the severe phenotype leading to frequent bleeding and need for use of costly factor 9 prophylaxis several times per week. Therefore, the aim of a single liver-directed gene therapy for this indication is to achieve transduced endogenous functional factor 9 levels such that the phenotype is converted to mild or even normal, and with that, prevention of bleeding, particularly spontaneous bleeds that cause lots of damage in these patients. One product in clinical development is AMT060. This contains a wild type factor 9 gene with a liver specific promoter packed in an AAV5 capsid. The results of the first in human phase 1 2 trial are shown here. One patient in the low dose cohort on the left hand side, the green line, did not respond to the gene therapy, whereas the other four patients are free of prophylaxis currently, with individual factor 9 levels ranging between approximately 3% to 12% of normal, with a mean of almost 5% of normal. Factor 9 levels in the high dose cohort were slightly higher, ranging from approximately 3% to 14% of normal, with a mean of 7% of normal, as you can see in the panel on the right hand side. The company subsequently developed AMT061, containing the factor 9 Padua mutated gene in the same cassette and capsid that has an approximately six-fold enhanced activity compared to the wild type. The first results in the phase 2b trial demonstrate this nicely with factor 9 activities ranging between 25% and 50% of normal in the three patients that were treated. Consequently, no prophylaxis has been used and no bleeding occurred. On the safety side, no transaminase increases or loss of factor 9 activity occurred and therefore none of the patients needed immunosuppressive therapy. Similar results were previously achieved with another product containing the Padua factor 9 mutated gene SPK9001, with factor 9 levels ranging between 10% and 60% of normal. These results are, in my view, a breakthrough in the treatment of hemophilia, as treatment can be considered even curative in some patients, as they have now factor 9 levels within the normal range without any need for uh, factor 9 prophylaxis and without spontaneous bleedings. After having shared these promising and important clinical advancements with gene therapy, I would like to close my part of today's webinar with some challenges as well. Some of these have already mentioned by Todd. To start with trial-related challenges, um, these start with the fact as Todd mentioned as well, that gene therapy is mainly developed for severe and rare diseases. Therefore, the usual trial designs, like in oncology or cardiovascular indications, are simply not 
achievable. Most trials are single arm, and if a control group is desired, the golden standard of a randomized control trials of standard of care or placebo control is not feasible due to low prevalence of patients, but also due to the large sample sizes needed for adequate statistical power and analysis. Natural history data or an appropriate lead-in phase in a trial with long enough duration are alternative approaches. Todd also already mentioned the issue with endpoints or outcome assessments. In very often, the, the, the optimal uh, choice of endpoint is simply unknown or endpoints have yet to be validated within a clinical development program as was done, for example, for the development of Luxterna with the mobility testing. Furthermore, long-term, at least five years of follow-up is recommended and therefore patient retention is of utmost importance. The next speaker will speak further to this. I mentioned already the product-related challenges and the last hurdle, of course, is market access, which comes usually at a high price that, although treatments are single, need to be affordable. This is also recognized by the companies that produce, manufacture and market gene therapies by novel reimbursement models which are under development. And with that you can think of staggered payments and also no cure, no pay clausules. With that I came to the end of my presentation and I would like to hand over to Matvi who will discuss a variety of operational considerations for gene therapy trials. So over to you, Matvi. Thank you, Marco. In the following section, I will discuss considerations for rare disease gene therapy trials from a clinical operations perspective. I would like to start with site selection. It is ideal to select sites with prior gene therapy experience. This can be easily achieved for a phase one and two trials that require small sample size. However, for large phase three trials, sites without gene therapy experience might need to be considered. Therefore, thorough feasibility needs to be done to ensure that sites are adequately qualified to participate in gene therapy trials. I would like to focus on three aspects of feasibility, the first being site pharmacy. It is important to make sure that the site is qualified to handle gene therapy products. Feasibility should focus on both the pharmacy infrastructure as well as the processes. As far as infrastructure is concerned, one of the key factor is to make sure that the site has biological safety cabinets or isolators that meet the grade requirements. In terms of processes, some of the site's standard operating procedures may not align completely with protocol-specified investigational product handling procedures. This discussion of the processes that are not in line with the protocol, the impact of these deviations on the study, and their documentation process needs to be done early in the process prior to site selection. Now moving on to dosing capabilities. Some studies require the sites to use specific dosing equipment based on prior compatibility testing. For sites that do not have protocol specified equipment, sponsor might need to provide the equipment. Dosing often involves collaboration between various departments, including pharmacy department, infusion or surgical unit, and research unit. It is important to make sure that the sites can streamline the collaborative process prior to site selection. The other consideration is the number of potential subjects. This information is often captured as a part of feasibility for all trials. For gene therapy trials in specific, it is also important to get an estimate on number of potential subjects that are interested in participating in the gene therapy trials. After the feasibility process is done, there could be two categories of sites, the sites that have gene therapy experience and the ones that do not have gene therapy experience but have potential subjects. In this situation, centralized dosing approach can be adopted to include sites that do not have gene therapy experience. 
This strategy will help to meet recruitment goals and at the same time minimize patient burden. In this approach, the sites that have prior gene therapy experience can serve as central dosing sites. The sites that do not have gene therapy experience, referred as local sites hereafter, can screen the subjects, and once the subjects are deemed eligible, the subjects can be dosed at central dosing sites. Most of the post-dosing follow-up visits can then be continued at local sites. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to discuss some considerations for centralized dosing model. This approach involves extensive collaboration between dosing and local sites. It is important to make sure that communication is initiated between the sites early in the process. It is also important to ensure that the following are in place prior to screening the first patient. Appropriation, appropriate delegation of responsibilities among personnel from both the sites and their documentation. Making sure there is a streamlined process for transfer of medical records prior to and after dosing. Aligning the visit schedules between dosing and local sites. Scheduling the shipment of investigational product in a timely manner. Next slide, please. As far as regulatory requirements are concerned, it is important to make sure all the relevant dosing site information is submitted to the local site IRB or ethics committee. Necessary dosing site language is included in the local site informed consent form. For trials that have dosing and local sites located in different countries, making sure that clinical trial insurance is in place to cover the subjects in both countries. Next slide, please. In terms of electronic data capture system access, both local and dosing sites need to have access to subjects' case report forms. Appropriate access needs to be provided to the personnel with regards to data entry and sign of privileges. Subject source documentation will be present at both the local and dosing sites. Therefore, streamlined monitoring process needs to be in place to ensure continuity. Subjects need to travel to and from dosing sites. It is important to decrease patient burden by providing travel and boarding arrangements. Next slide, please. Now I would like to switch gears to startup in the U.S. Until last year, startup process for gene therapy trials included submission to NIH Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, or RAC. On August 17, 2018, twin changes were proposed that eliminates RAC review for human gene therapy trials. This change is actually will cut down on the startup timelines. Additionally, the responsibilities of Institutional Biosafety Committee, or IBC, which has local oversight of research, will be revised. In the U.S., gene therapy studies must be reviewed by IRBs and IBCs. However, some sites may require additional scientific committees to review the protocol, and this may impact the timelines of the startup process. Next slide, please. Now moving on to site training. Most gene therapy trials typically involve single dose administration. It is important to make sure that the site is adequately trained prior to screening and dosing a subject. This involves adequately addressing any outstanding questions or issues with protocol or dosing procedures, making sure that all the dosing logistics are in place prior to screening. Encouraging sites to have a dry run, which will help streamline coordination between departments, address any questions regarding handling investigational products, review pharmacy logistics, ensure all the necessary equipment are in place prior to actual dosing, and address any questions with record keeping. Next slide, please. In the next couple of slides, I will discuss about recruitment and retention challenges associated with rare disease gene therapy trials. One of the main challenges with rare disease trials is that target population is small and geographically dispersed. Outreach efforts need to be in place to meet enrollment goals. 
advocacy groups are a good resource. Apart from providing patient support services, some of the advocacy groups maintain registries and provide genotyping services that can be tapped into for outreach purposes. Genetic counselors serve as valuable resource to disseminate trial information. It is important to encourage sites to engage with genetic counselors early in the process. Other recruitment strategies include developing physician referral network by collaborative work between sponsor, CRO, and site, as well as ad campaigns involving social media and search engine optimization. Digital health technology, which involves real-time registries, is setting a new direction for rare disease trials. As it gains more traction, we will be hearing more about this in the near future. Next slide, please. Patient education about the indication, available treatment options, and gene therapy intervention is important. Patient factors such as quality of life is an important determinant of the enrollment. Patients with indications that adversely affect the quality of life are more motivated to participate in gene therapy trials. Especially, parents are highly motivated to enroll their kids in the trial in the hope for better future for their kids. We also see that some patients are on the fence as they cannot weigh between the potential benefit versus perceived risk of gene therapy. This is also reflected in terms of longer consenting times when compared to non-gene therapy trials. Therefore, it is important to encourage principal investigators to address any questions or concerns the subject has regarding the trial early in the process. Patient brochures such as what is gene therapy can help with this process. Some patients may not be inclined to participate in early phase trials due to lack of preliminary safety and efficacy data. Keeping these patients informed of any preliminary data from early phase trials may help them decide to participate in late phase trials. Next slide, please. As Marco and Todd mentioned, the interventional part of the gene therapy trials is preceded by natural history or lead-in phase. The natural history phase can be used to educate the patients about the potential gene therapy intervention. However, it is also important to set subjects' expectations that participation in natural history study does not guarantee participation in the interventional part of the trial as they may or may not meet eligibility criteria at the time of intervention trial. Gene therapy trials are designed to have frequent post-dosing visits followed by long-term visits to monitor safety. Subjects should be informed of the visits so they are aware of what is involved and plan accordingly. Patient journey brochures can help with this process. It is also important to emphasize to the sites to plan ahead to avoid missing important data points. Tools such as visit schedulers will help site personnel keep track and prepare for upcoming visits. For visits that does, that does not require subjects to be present at site, home health services, phone call visits, review of medical records, or a combination of the aforementioned can be used. Patient burden can be minimized by providing travel arrangements. Next slide, please. Now I would like to thank everybody for joining this session and I'll pass now I'll pass this to Todd for Q&A session. Todd. Thanks, Madhvi. Uh, we did receive a few questions, so I'd like to just go through those. I continue to invite folks that um, as you've listened to the presenters today, if you have some questions, whether they're comments or questions, please feel free to put those in the comment box. We're happy to respond to as many of those as possible. It was mentioned, one of the questions we got is, it was mentioned uh, in the earlier uh, presentation that 62% uh, of orphan applications are submitted simultaneously between the US and the EU. And the question asked, does orphan designation granted outside the European Union count within the European Union based on this kind of dual application? And, and the short answer is no, it does not. Each geography, as, as we discussed, has different qualifying criteria. 
However, if in the case of submitting to both US and EU, both geographies recognize the disease of interest as qualifying for rare disease, they accept a unified application, but each has a geographically specific criteria that they apply to that specific application. So I just wanted to, as a point of clarity, it doesn't mean that one approval in one geography would supersede the authority of uh, the, the folks in another geography. Also, there was a, a question asking about the illustrative U.S. metrics that were uh, shown in terms of applications for orphan designation, et cetera. And I just wanted to clarify two points on, on that data. One, there were three slides that were presented. The first one was how many applications file for consideration to qualify. The second slide, spoke to the fact of how many of those that were submitted did in fact meet the rare disease criteria and thereby qualify for future consideration. And the third slide that was shown uh, was really trying to highlight how many successfully achieved approval and market authorization. And there, there were certainly some assertions made that I, I just want to clarify Obviously, as much as we would like to hope that we had efficiency within the legislative process, we do not often receive uh, uh, decisions and approvals in the same year in which an application is submitted. So when you look at the stats that were presented in there, the inference was all that's happening real time and that you can kind of cross compare. And that's not actually the case. And that's why I had mentioned early on in the talk wanted to kind of look at the trend of data. And I think the trend appropriately characterizes um, how many of these applications progress for further consideration and then the distillation of how many successfully achieve. So again, it's kind of the magnitude of difference I was trying to highlight. So apologies if there was any confusion uh, with regard to that. Also had a question regarding that um, in the U.S. it was mentioned that oftentimes smaller patient-sized trials and potentially a single trial may be acceptable to the FDA when reviewing clinical evidence for rare disease development. And the question is, are there different regulatory standards for demonstrating the safety and effectiveness of a drug to treat rare diseases versus traditional drug development? And the answer is there are not different standards, but there are different approaches. And FDA regulations require at least one adequate and well-controlled trial to support considerations for market authorization. As many are aware, FDA routinely asks for two because they, they want to verify outcomes. However, FDA is required by statute to exercise their scientific judgment in determining what kind and what quantity of study or studies are necessary to support uh, and inform on a decision for market approval. So what we do see as a general trend with rare diseases, because of some of the difficulties that we've discussed in terms of geographical dispersion, um, you know, enrollment, recruiting, treatment, et cetera, FDA does routinely exercise uh, scientific judgment in terms of weight of evidence approach and supporting and kind of nurturing the approval of these products to market. So uh, while there's not a different standard in terms of evidence, there's a oftentimes a difference in threshold based on the scientific merit of the data that's presented. And another question received, and sorry to, to hog all these, these seem to be centered around the regulatory aspect. Um, since the majority of the global authorities rely on prevalence numbers to determine eligibility of an orphan drug designation for treatment, 
are prevention therapies eligible for orphan designation? And if so, how's prevalence determined for a prevention therapy such as a vaccine? And actually, FDA interprets the 200,000 patient threshold cutoff to refer to the number of individuals for whom a vaccine would be indicated at, at the date in which an orphan designation would occur. So they recognize you can't do prevalence as you're uh, looking to prevent, but you need to quantify the scale of those affected. And, and let me also add that, you know, if a disease, uh, if a treatment for a rare disease is a, for an acute condition, um, incidence is accepted uh, as an estimate of the population rather than prevalence. And if the disease is relapsing or re-emitting disease episodic with acute durations in between, then FDA looks back to the prevalence estimate as a way to kind of guide those decision and qualifying criteria. So that, that concludes the questions that we received from the audience. And if there are no more questions, I'd like to turn this over to Tegan to wrap up and close out the session. Perfect. Thank you so much for all of those answers. As, as you said, we have reached the end of our Q&A period, but if we weren't able to attend to your questions, you can uh, try and direct any further questions to this email that's showing up on your screen right now, and the team at MedPace may, follow, may try and follow up with you after the webinar. Just in closing, I would like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. You can share the webinar on LinkedIn and actually if you direct your attention to the chat box, I have just shared the link that you, or you are invited to go ahead and share on your own LinkedIn profiles. Again, I would like to say thank you to all of our speakers, Todd, Madvi, and Marco. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.